you talk in the book also about staying engaged in the treatment. That is a different thing than enabling. And I know you kind of have different perspectives on, you know, as you shared, kind of enabling or, or what people are supposed to do when their loved one is still using. But I guess what's the difference between, you know, being engaged in their treatment and loving them and caring about their well-being versus enabling? Because I think that people feel like there's like a blurred line there. And if they're being yes. nice, then they're enabling them. So how... How does someone navigate that territory? Yeah, super, super challenging. I think our culture at large is so confusing on this front and really does a disservice to these ideas of helping um, and does, certainly does a disservice to family members who are really struggling to be helpful and don't want to do the wrong thing and you know, and it, when you tell somebody that they're being enabling, it's so demoralizing. Here I am trying my best to help. And now you're telling me that that helping behavior is enabling or codependent or, right? I think codependent, honestly, is such a terrible word because it just really like makes people feel so bad about themselves. It's not just like the behavior is codependent. You are codependent. Like who you are is flawed. It's really, uh, uh, I mean, that's a whole other discussion, I guess. But, but uh, clearly it pushes my buttons. But that I think that I have a lot of compassion for family members who feel stuck around this is what I mean to say. Is like if, if there's a lot of mixed messages um, out there about you should cut them off, but you know, do an intervention. Those are opposite things, but somehow we give parents both of those messages. So it's, I think there's a lot of mixed messages and it's really hard. There's no like clear line in the sand um, that will, will help people feel sure about, you know, what they're, whether they're doing the right thing, or the wrong thing, but you know, Enabling is doing something that increases the likelihood of the unhealthy behaviors continuing. That's what it is. And, you know, there's lots of ways that that gets very confusing very fast. Like, I pay for my kids' rent, and sometimes they're doing things that I think are unhealthy, like using substances. So, am I enabling them? Well, if they're not doing anything else but using those substances, then I guess I am enabling them to do those negative things. But I'm also enabling them to have more of an independent life. And I'm also enabling my family to have a less stressful life by them not being here. And I'm also enabling them to potentially live closer to their job where they need to go. And I'm also enabling them to uh, be more responsible for figuring out how to live an independent life beyond just rent, like paying bills and, you know, understanding how that banking works and, you know, writing checks. I don't know if anybody writes checks anymore. I'll just make that up. Uh, but you know what my point is, <laughs> is that there's lots of ways that um, a helping behavior can enable negative behaviors and it might also be enabling positive behaviors and so i would love to just take back that word and i, I acknowledge that it can mean the support of behaviors and sometimes those behaviors are positive and sometimes they're negative so i think i think the the main thing to be thoughtful about that most people don't hear enough from treatment providers is that there are lots of behaviors that you can participate in enabling that are really helpful, like strategies for managing stress. If I say out loud, you know, I had a really tough day and I'm going to take a long bath, I don't want any interruptions, I'm going to read my book, and then I'm going to spend a few minutes walking around the block and talk to my sister and then I'm gonna come home and then I'll be available to you guys. If I say that out loud, I am both enacting, if, as long as I do it, I'm enacting positive, healthy response to stress, and I'm also role modeling that for my kids, for my partner. You know, That is a, 
a multi-dimensioned strategy for conveying and enabling other people to learn how to manage their stress in my in my family right so those are things that i don't think we give enough credit to because that's a learning process why do many people start using substances and drinking it decreases stress it decreases anxiety it does that's what alcohol does it brings down your anxiety <laughs> it's very effective i mean you know I, I don't think we should mince words when it comes to like what the positive impact of substances are and alcohol will do that it also has all these downsides that we want to avoid and so it's not a great strategy for managing anxiety and it certainly can go haywire if it's the only strategy you have so the things that family members can do that are really helpful is to enable positive behaviors to support and role model positive behaviors small to large you know how about drink refusal skills do your kids ever see their parents refusing a drink do they know how it's done do they know how to say it what words would they use can they make a joke about it like teenagers need these skills they need to be able to say like oh, i'm good what are you obsessed with that thing like put it away honestly they need words and the best way for them to have words is to hear it from other people around them to hear it they're not going to hear it on watching tv that's for sure like my god so you need as a family member to offer them strategies that's enabling positive behavior so I, I think when people talk about enabling and codependency I, I i kind of veer the other direction like we've all been talking about that let's talk more about like how do we really enrich and give more support and nourishment to these positive behaviors that will you know eke out the space that is left for the negative behaviors it will shove it out you know the more flowers you have in the garden the less room there are for the weeds that's just how it works and you want to figure out how to water those flowers without watering the weeds it's not just about going into the garden and ripping out every you know weed you see that's sort of the kick them out throw them in rehab kind of approach maybe sometimes that's necessary for sure but also you need to water the flowers that's a big piece yeah i think a big part of what you guys offer at cmc and in the book too is just like skillful communication because like you said the words like we don't have the words or the tools and how to navigate this and i think we've been told for so long that you know you're an addict you got to go out and get treatment there's nothing i can do but there's so much we can do as the loved one um next to them that i think you guys provide like a roadmap to how to navigate these tough conversations so, you know, one of the last questions I wanted to ask you, you were kind of talking about it as far as like what a loved one can do for someone who is struggling. So is there anything else you wanted to say there as far as like first steps someone can do if they're, they've got a loved one that's struggling and they don't know how to approach the situation? Sure. So there's a lot of resources that we've tried to put together um, that you can find on the CMC website, um, Center for Motivation and Change website, also on the CMC Foundation for Change website. Um, the 20-minute the guide, the20minuteguide.com, um, has a bunch of little, you know, exercises, kind of homework stuff that we put together right after writing Beyond Addiction because it's sort of like homeworky stuff that came out of the book. Um, so that's a, that's a, a good uh, resource as well. And the there's one of my colleagues, Dr. Josh King, he does a podcast called uh, The Beyond Addiction Show, which um, interviews a bunch of uh, experts in different areas of um, you know, like eating disorders and thinking about cannabis use uh, medically and recreationally. Um, lots of different uh, really great interviews there. 
and there's also a YouTube channel um, and a Facebook page. Um, I guess there's a bunch of things. <laughs> uh, you know, I'm not a huge Facebook person, but you know, now in the age of COVID, uh, this is like what we're doing, right? Is we're doing all this stuff. So there's all those different approaches. And I think, um, you know, whatever f the, the, main, the main line, uh, main message that I would have for family members is to, to know that there is help out there and that you're not alone. And um, a lot of people feel like it's an obstacle, especially now, um, for them to go to an al meeting. And they maybe, maybe have been told, like if you go to your pediatrician and say like, I'm afraid my kid is smoking pot, they're very likely gonna tell you to go to an al meeting. Um, or they're gonna tell you to go to a therapist um, to take care of yourself. And that therapist may know nothing about substance use. I'm sorry to say that that's, but that's, that's very likely. And so those are not the only two things available for you to do. Um, and I think that's an important message because Al-Anon is super helpful for a lot of people, but it doesn't work for everybody. And especially right now online, people feel very nervous about going on meetings on Zoom. And, you know, we have to just accept that that is an obstacle for people and not get into fights about like, no, it's really the only way to go. Like, of course, it's the only way to go for some people, but it's not the only way to go for all people. And just accept that that's the case and provide options for people to have, because it really is important that people not get stuck alone in their own head and tell themselves a lie, which is that they are uniquely dealing with this issue. That's just not the case. Lots and lots of people are dealing with this issue and you do have people out there who have had similar experiences. So you're not alone. There are a lot of resources available. The only answers do not lie in Al-Anon and interventions and, um, and therapy even. You know, like there are other ways of going about finding information that can be helpful to you. Yeah, and I will link all those resources below. And I know this book talks a lot about self-care and I think it's an act of self-care to get this book and, and look into the resources you've provided because it's just really empowering when you have the tools and the foundation to better communicate and you don't feel as helpless over this. Um, so yeah, I, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I really enjoyed it and just got so much out of it. And I appreciate all your insights and knowledge and just helped so much. So thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. All right. Talk to you later. Okay. Bye. Bye.